We are beginning a new cycle of the Torah and a new cycle of the Parsha podcast. Yesterday, Tuesday, was Simcha's Torah, and we finished the Torah with much pomp and ceremony, and we danced with the Torah, and we rejoiced with the Torah, and we concluded the book of Deuteronomy, thus finishing the Torah, and as we have done for thousands of years, we began the Torah anew with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. At the Parsha Podcast, we are beginning a new cycle of the Parsha Podcast, the year 7, with the help of the Almighty and with your dedicated listenership. And this is the plan for this upcoming year of the Parsha Podcast. On Sunday, please God, we will re-release the rebroadcast as we have done now for some time. And it covers the whole Parsha in about an hour. It's a great way to get up to speed on the Parsha, to have a basic understanding of the narrative flow of what the Parsha contains, some of the critical Rashis, some of the important Rambans, some of the themes and the motifs and the ideas dominating the Parsha. On Thursday, please God, we will release a brand new episode on the Parsha with the theme of raising your Parsha IQ and your your general intelligence. Torah, of course, is the only thing documented to raise your intelligence. And the new Parsha podcast, please God, will have two segments, one with an I, one with a Q, an idea and a question, an insight and a quip, an innovative, illuminative, illustrative inquiry and a quixotic quandary IQ. That's for Thursday. And then on Tuesday, please God, we will re-release the episode from two years ago from the Jewish calendar year 5781. The re-release of 5781 will be clearly labeled as 5781. So if you don't want to listen to something you've listened to in the past, you could just skip that. But I think, you know, it's been... It's been over 100 episodes, or really 100 weeks, since those podcasts were initially released. Many of y'all are newer listeners, and even some of the old timers who have been with us since the beginning. If you're anything like me, you don't remember what was said 100 weeks ago. And therefore, I figured it would be beneficial to have more Parsha in our week and to re-listen to the episode from two years ago, 5781, again this year. Now that year featured a segment that we called Answers and Questions, A and Q, where we would ask a question of the Parsha and solicit answers from the audience. If you want, you could play along with that each week. It's totally up to you. Now today is Wednesday morning. And our plan is to re-release 5781 every Tuesday, but of course Tuesday was Simchas Torah. So it's Wednesday morning, I hustled over to the Torch Center to re-release this episode. Last night, we spent the night dissembling our sukkah with my boys. But in general, most Tuesdays, please God, you can look forward to the re-release of 5781 with A and Q each Tuesday And then, please, God, to raise your Parsha IQ each Thursday. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalp.com. Enjoy this maiden episode of 5781 with the A&Q. I look forward to speaking to you again, please, God, tomorrow on Thursday and raising our Parsha IQ and general intelligence together. Welcome to year five of the Parsha podcast. I am so excited, thrilled, overjoyed, delighted, excited in every possible conceivable way to begin year five of the Parsha podcast. I thank you so much for your support, for your friendship, and for listening to the Parsha podcast. A little bit of basics, I'm sure most of y'all know this already, but my name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. I work for Torch an outreach and Jewish education organization in Houston, Texas. I am currently in the vaunted Torch Center. I want to thank all the podcast listeners across all the channels for their incredible support to me and to our organization. 
As you know, we cannot subsist or thrive or exist without the support and the friendship and the generosity of all of y'all. Thank you for that. It's also important for me to mention that in addition to the Parsha podcast, I am the proud host of five other podcasts. The Jewish History Podcast, of course, Torah 101, the Mitzvah Podcast, the Ethics Podcast, and the Flagship Podcast, which is called This Jewish Life. Also, it's very important for you to know that we are still giving away hundreds of free gifts, hundreds of mitzvah magnets, the specialized Torch Shabbat light switch covers. Visit our website, torchweb.org, and claim yours. We'll ship it to you for free. In addition, because this is the first episode of the new year, I want to remind everyone that my older brother, Rabbi Ari Wolby, has a podcast of his own. It's called the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. He has very big and lofty ambitions to leapfrog his younger brother in podcasting. So give that a listen. Again, it's called the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. And finally... I have a dear friend named Dan Coleman who started his own podcast called the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed. And just today, he released perhaps the finest episode that he's done yet. It's called Living Jewish, in which he interviews my two oldest sons, Akiva Wolby, age 12, and Yehoshua Wolby, age 11. And he talks to them about what it's like to grow up in a Jewish community. And it's a very interesting window into the kind of life that these children live. I personally listen to it with tremendous relish and give it a listen yourself. Again, this is the Shema podcast called The Podcast for the Perplexed. And the most recent episode is the one that you should give a listen to, but also listen to the rest of them. They are fantastic. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail. Dot com. And I look forward to hearing from you, all your questions and comments and feedback of all sorts. This week is Parsha's Beratius, the first Parsha in the Torah, and arguably the most difficult Parsha to process. Every part of the Parsha seems to be a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. It seems like the whole Parsha is deeply impenetrable. It starts off, of course, with the creation. Everything that we know of, everything that we don't know of, everything that is not God is described in the first chapter of Genesis. Six days or six plus one days and everything is created. All the stars, all the galaxies, all the creatures, everything. And we have 31 verses to describe it all. It seems like it's a wholly non-exhaustive retelling of Genesis. Very difficult to understand what the message is. And of course, we meet Adam at the end of chapter 1, and then Adam is created again in chapter 2. And that, of course, is one of the major questions. You know, why is Adam being created twice? Or what is the essence or the secret of the creation of Adam? Adam is placed in this garden that is replete with all kinds of trees. It's got the tree of life. It's got the tree of knowledge, good and evil. And he's told you were placed in this garden to guard it and to work. Of course, that is a mystery. What exactly is going on? Eve is created. She is crafted as a partner for Adam. We have, of course, the wily serpent, and he's trying to cause them to sin. God tells Adam and Eve, you can eat it from all the trees, but not from the tree of knowledge. They capitulate, they submit. Maybe there's no part of the Torah that has more literature trying to plumb its depths than the whole episode of Adam and Eve in the garden. And after their sin, they realize that they're naked. There's so many things going on. They hide behind the tree and God dispenses his punishment. They are banished, booted from the garden and the mighty places a flaming, swirling sword barring entry to the garden to all but the worthiest. Of course, the Parsha tells us about Cain and Abel. We have the first sibling rivalry and the first homicide as well. We read about the long lives of all the generations spanning from Adam to Noah. 
we're kind of like running through thousands of years of history, and the parsha ends with a decline, a marked decline in the spiritual state of humanity. My grandfather, blessed memory, used to say, every parsha, you can understand it on multiple levels. There's the simple level that everyone can understand, and then there's the more advanced levels, and then there's the higher and higher and higher levels. And Parsha is precious. The first Parsha of the Torah, there is no way to understand it on a simple level. Nevertheless, I think there are a lot of amazing insights in our Parsha that could be very inspiring, that could be very informative, that could be very educational, that could be very enlightening. And I believe that one of the major themes of our Parsha is perhaps the most empowering idea in the entire Torah. And the place where this is found is somewhat of an unusual place. The Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin tells us that when you have witnesses who are alleging a capital crime, they say that they witnessed an individual commit a crime deemed worthy by the Torah of capital punishment, they are levying a very serious allegation against the defendant. The Talmud tells us, well, how are these witnesses, how are they processed? How does the court cross-examine the witnesses to determine whether or not they're saying the truth? Are they lying? Are they framing an innocent man? Is it legit? And the first thing that the court tries to impress upon the witnesses is the eternal consequences of killing an innocent man. They tell him, you should know that monetary cases are not like capital crime cases. A monetary case, you frame the guy, you embezzle some money, and you know how you can fix it? You pay the guy back. And you're good. But what happens if you kill an innocent man? Of course, murder is the most unconscionable act that we know of. But it's not just the murder of one man. It's the murder of one man and all the potential that could have come out of that person. Maybe the man would have had a child. And now that you killed an innocent man, you killed that child as well. And the grandchild and the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren, and the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great forever, ad infinitum, you are a murderer of millions, if not billions of people when you kill one innocent man. Be very careful of the gravity of what you are doing, these witnesses are told. And the sages actually bring proof from our parsha In the aftermath of the fratricide, the Almighty tells Cain, the bloods, plural, the bloods of your brother are crying out to me from the ground. Says the Talmud, why does it not say the blood of your brother? The answer is because Cain did not murder only his brother Abel, the potential children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, all those bloods are all part of this act. That's the first thing that the witnesses are told. And the core continues to talk about how important and how valuable a single human life is. Adam was created, these witnesses are told, as one person. And that tells you that if you kill one person, it's as if you've destroyed the entire world. And if you save one person, It's as if you've saved the entire world. And that's why Adam was created alone. There weren't thousands, millions of Adams. There was one. Maybe there were millions of animals, millions of cows and millions of dogs and millions of grasshoppers, but there's only one Adam. And one of the reasons why Adam was created alone is to impress upon ourselves as we read his story, the value of of one life. Therefore, concludes the court, 
every individual, every person must say, the world was created for me. There's an astonishing proclamation that the Talmud says. Every single person must say, I am like Adam. Adam was one person. I am one person. And Adam was the fulfillment, was the embodiment of the Almighty's purpose and creation. One person alone could be the fulfillment of the purpose of creation. And therefore, I am like Adam. I'm also only one person. And I too am the fulfillment of the purpose of creation. And therefore, I must say, the entire world was created for me. And my grandfather, blessed memory, used to always say that this is not hyperbolic. This is not an exaggeration. A person has to literally believe that the entire world, the entire universe, all the galaxies, the sun and the moon and the stars and all the trees and all the flowers and all the things that we know and all the things that we don't know, all of that was created for me. Adam, he was certainly unique. He was certainly the purpose of creation. Our sages are telling us that the unique individuality of Adam was not diluted despite the fact that he has billions of descendants. Each one of us are like Adam, our forbearer, in that just like Adam, he was the ultimate purpose of all of creation, so too we, each one of us as an individual, are the ultimate purpose of all of creation. This is an astonishing idea. Every person you meet, you walk down the street, you see loads of people. You have your neighbor on the right side, your neighbor on the left side, and the person across the street. You have the people you went to school with, the children in the class, your own children, your parents, your co-workers and colleagues. Every single person must know that the world is created for them. And there's an obvious problem. We live in a world with seven plus billion people. Yet I, Yaakov Wolby, must declare that the world, the entire world, was all created for me. Well, if the world created for me, then the purpose of the world has been fulfilled with me. And how could someone else say the world created for them? If there's only one world, there can be only one purpose for that world. There's several answers to this question. Some suggest that there's not one world. There are seven plus billion concurrent worlds. The sun that I see, the angle that I have, the things that I encounter are my unique world. And every person is a unique player, a unique protagonist in their own world. The world, perhaps we could say, is a single player game. And you know what? We're not inclined to initially notice that. We have to learn this lesson. We have to absorb this teaching. Every person is a unique world onto their own. And the fact that we all happen to be geographically in the same place, geography is not the world. All of us just happen to coincide. All of our worlds happen to coincide in this Venn diagram, if you will. But each person has their own unique world. That's one way of framing the answer. And there's more to it. But I think there's another angle to this question. If the world was created for me, I'm like Adam. How could the world be created for you? How could you be like Adam as well? There's only one Adam. And perhaps the answer is, Adam 
was the only person in the world. And Adam and Eve, of course, they're a team. They are a single spiritual unit. But how many people in history were like me? With my background, with my skill set, with my personality, with the way I look, with the way I speak. I've been told I have the great voice for radio and a great face for radio. Maybe it's good that I'm doing podcasting. I don't know if that's true. But everyone's unique. And it's just an astonishing thing that you can look at a person and every person has, hopefully every person has a nose and eyes and it's all the same shape roughly. Yet there's billions and billions of them and each one's unique. You could identify just by looking at someone's face who they are. It's an amazing thing. We all have our own fingerprints. We're all unique. And we're all a combination, a unique combination that was never seen before in history and will never be replicated in history. And therefore, me as an individual, I am Adam. Because of this version of humanity, there's only one. There's only me. I'm Adam. And you know what? You have your version of existence that's never been replicated. That's a once in history phenomenon. And in that sense, you are the Adam of that world. We each have our own unique blend of our individual life, our skills, our abilities, our strengths, our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities. But in addition, we each have our own mission. We each have our own responsibility of what the Almighty demands of us. The world has a purpose and each person has their role to play, their mission to fulfill, their job to get done in this world, and no one else could do it. It's your job and your job alone. And the Almighty tailors your life and your abilities and all those characteristics of the things that make you, you, and you not someone else, that makes you unique, all that is handcrafted by the Almighty, hand-tailored by God, to enable you to fulfill your mission. And what happens if you have witnesses that come and they want to tamper with it? They're trying to destroy the whole world because the Almighty created the whole world and all the various people in it and every person is part of this purpose and if the person exists... There must be a reason for them to exist and there must be a responsibility that is placed upon them and only they could do what they must do. And therefore, we have to recognize the value, the supreme worth of every individual. It's almost as if the fate of the world hangs in the balance to be determined by that individual. We, I think, are, are raised or we live in a world that doesn't give us this message. It's almost like the world is designed or, or maybe the tension that exists in this world is in this particular question. Am I going to live my life as an individual, as an atom with a D? Or am I going to be an atom with a, with a T maybe? Just one of millions or billions of identical things. Which Adam will I be? Am I going to be an individual? Am I going to live my life as if there's never been anyone like me and there's something once in history that's unique about me, that's unreplicated by anyone else? Am I going to be an individual? Or am I going to be generic? Cookie cutter like everyone else. Go with the flow. Our sages tell us that there are three things that remove a person from the world. 
And the first on that list is envy. My grandfather, a blessed memory, used to say that the essence of envy is a person viewing his or herself as being generic and not unique. What's the tension? Am I an individual crafted by God and given all the things that I need to complete my mission and the things that I don't need to complete my mission, I'm not given. Is my world and my life tailored by God or is it all random? And if it's random, well then I want to get as much stuff as possible. And therefore I'm envious of this person, envious envious of that person. If you are a total one of one, if there's never been another person like you, and that is the handiwork of God, then certainly it doesn't make sense for you to be envious because the Almighty gives you everything that you need to fulfill your mission. Our parasha, we read about Adam. And we're told that every person has to realize they are the Adam in their world. What an empowering idea. There's only been one of me. There's only been one of you. And that, of course, makes our life really valuable. There's something that I can do that no one else can. And, of course, that brings great responsibility. There's something that I must do Because no one else can. One person changes the trajectory of everything. Because one person has all that power. Abraham, the perfect example of someone who realized that he's unique, that he's one of one. And therefore, one person can single-handedly change the trajectory of humanity. Moses, a one of one. He's unique. There's never going to be anyone like him. And he single-handedly brings Torah down from heaven. And what's the idea of Messiah? One person changing the entire world. I think it's so fitting that when we start the Torah, the first person we meet is Adam, and his legacy is somewhat mixed, shall we say. But there's something that he represents in an undeniable fashion. He is one person upon whom everything rests. He and he alone must fulfill his unique mission. That's how we start Torah. And people think, you know, Torah, hey, it's a list of laws and responsibilities, And there's very little wiggle room or flexibility. It's very rigid. And the first person we meet is a unique one of one in history. What this is telling us, perhaps, that yes, of course, the laws of Torah are fixed and immutable and inflexible and really the same for each person. But Adam is showing us, and we're starting the Torah with the recognition that each individual has their own spiritual mission that they must discover and they must fulfill. Our sages tell us that this really encompasses every area of our lives. Not only do we have a unique skill set and we have a unique mission and we have a unique set of abilities that is unrivaled by any other person in history. Each one of us have a superpower. Each one of us have a special combination of skills that no one else has. And if we discover that superpower, we're on our way to discovering who we really are and what we must fulfill and what we must accomplish. And we're on our way to becoming our Adam. And on the flip side, we all have our own unique vulnerabilities and challenges. Each one of us is a Superman with our own 
kryptonite, if you will. We each have our own Achilles heel. The Mishnah tells us that every person whose fear of sin precedes his wisdom, his wisdom will endure. And the great Maharal gives a fascinating commentary where he highlights or he notes that the, the Hebrew words are Yirat Chet O, which means fear of his sin. It's not generic fear of sin, fear of his sin. And what he explains is that every person, because every person is unique, there's a unique area where a person is uniquely vulnerable. And part of becoming an Adam, Adam with a D, is being able to identify what's the particular area of life that I'm most vulnerable to. And if you identify that, you've identified both your vulnerability and your area of strength. Because the Eight Sahara doesn't attack weaknesses, it attacks strengths. And therefore, specifically in the area where you are most vulnerable is the area where your greatest strengths lie. This is a wonderful way to start the Torah. Each one of us are in our own world. Each one of us are our own Adam. Each one of us have our own unique skill set in abilities and in vulnerabilities. And each one of us are responsible to become an individual. And every person is required to say, the world was created for me. There's something that I can do that no one else can. I think it's a very empowering, if a bit terrifying, insight. Now, something hit me today, something I've been working on for literally more than a decade. And that is that there are three very perplexing statements in Talmudic and Midrashic literature that don't make any sense, but are very similar. And they are, number one, a person is obligated to say the world's created for me. And if you just walk around saying that, it sounds... Very hubristic, boastful. It sounds a little megalomaniacal. It sounds like a crazy thing to say. Yet the Talmud tells us you have to say it. That's item number one. And then you have teaching number two. And this is found in the Mishnah. A person is obligated, the same words, you're obligated to view yourself like you were personally rescued from Egypt, from the Exodus. You yourself were taken out of Egypt and you have to, you are obligated to view yourself in that way. And finally, we're told every person is obligated to say, when will my deeds rival the deeds of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And each one of these three things really sounds unfulfillable. A person is obligated to say, when will I be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? A person is obligated to view themselves as if they left Egypt? A person is obligated to say that the entire world is for them. And finally today, it hit me. What these teachings are all saying is a person is obligated to know at a very bare minimum, you must emerge from life knowing that you are unique. The world was created for you because you're unique. You are the atom of your world. You have to view yourself like you escaped Egypt. Egypt, the bondage, was about people not realizing that they were special. They didn't realize that they were unique. And finally, we have to aspire to be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they truly embody people who identified with their own individuality. You are Adam. There is no one who could do what you specifically can do. And you have to say, there is only a need for one person to change the entire world. And the question we often ask ourselves is, why can't that be me? 
Why can I be the Adam, the Abraham, the Moses, the Messiah to change the world? What power and what responsibility and what a way to begin the Torah? Now, I want to do a new segment in the Parsha podcast. That's called A and Q. Because everyone's familiar with the concept of Q and A, where the person who knows all the answers, the repository of all knowledge, will answer all your questions. But this year, I want to flip it on its head. This year, I want to introduce a new segment called A and Q, Answers and Questions, where I don't provide the answers, I provide the questions, and you, the audience of the Parsha Podcast, are tasked with finding answers. And if you'd like, you can always email me your answers, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. So here's the question for Parshas Bracious. In the end of chapter 3 of Genesis, chapter 3 of our Parsha, Adam's been created, Eve's been created, they've been placed in the garden, and they've been given the warning, and they've encountered the seductions of the serpent, and they've succumbed, and they were punished. And the verse tells us that Hashem made leather garments to Adam and Eve, and he clothed them. So the Almighty is crafting leather garments. What that means is a discussion, but he's there's some garments. Is that skin or is that something else? It's a whole discussion. But the Almighty is making garments, leather garments, for Adam and Eve and clothing them. So there's a teaching in the Talmud in the book of Sota, page 14a. This is such a fitting teaching to talk about at the beginning and at the end of Torah. Because whenever we're at the bookends of Torah, it's valuable to ask the question, okay, well, what's this all about? So here's what the Talmud tells us. Torah, Tchilasa, Gemilat Chasadim, Torah, its beginning is kindness, is acts of love and kindness. Visofa and its end, its conclusion, is also acts of love and kindness. Explains the Talmud. The beginning of the Torah is where the Almighty makes leather garments for Adam and his wife, Adam and Eve, and he clothes them. The Almighty does kindness with humanity. And the end of Torah is also kindness. Because the very last thing that happens to the Torah is the Almighty buries Moshe in the gorge, in the depression. Very end of Deuteronomy, very end of Devarim, chapter 34, Moshe dies, and who buries him? God buries him. And the commentaries explain, well, what's this Talmud telling us? What this Talmud is telling us is that if the Torah begins with one theme, and it ends with that same theme, that's coming to indicate that that's the entirety of Torah. What's Torah? It's about kindness. Now, why is it about kindness? A separate discussion. But here's the question. Here is the first A and Q segment of the fifth year of the Parsha podcast. The Torah begins with kindness. What example does the Talmud furnish to prove that the Torah begins with kindness? Chapter 3, verse 21 God makes for Adam and his wife leather garments, and he clothes them. And you know what? The Almighty providing clothing for Adam and Eve, that is an act of kindness. Undeniably so. But here's the question. Why does the Talmud have to go to the end of chapter 3 to find an example of divine kindness? Aren't there ample earlier Examples of godly kindness. Why? The creation of the world. Isn't that the ultimate act of divine kindness? In fact, scripture tells us, Olam Chesed Yibana, the world was built with kindness. And that precedes Adam and Eve being clothed by God. And perhaps you may say, well, you know what? The Torah wants to find an example, or the Talmud wants to find an example 
of God doing kindness specifically with humanity, well, even by that criteria, there's an earlier example. Adam is despondent. He is alone. He doesn't have a partner. And God says, it's not good for man to be alone. Let me make him a helper. And, of course, we know the story. The Almighty puts Adam into a deep slumber and takes out his rib and fashions Eve out of that. And when Adam wakes up from his surgery, he's so happy. He's overjoyed. This time it's bone from my bone. It's flesh from my flesh. I'm going to call this woman Isha. Uh, Isha This is amazing. He is overjoyed to have a spouse. Isn't that an example of godly kindness? Adam's alone. Adam's lonely. Adam's despondent. And the Almighty remedies his loneliness by giving him a wife. That's kindness. Yet that doesn't seem to qualify. And when the Talmud tells us the Torah begins with kindness, it can only find an example from chapter 3, verse 21, that Adam and Eve are given leather garments by God and clothed by God. And that's the first example. And the question is, why? Why do only these examples qualify, but not the earlier examples? Now, I'll tell you that I know at least two answers to this question. One answer I thought of myself, and one answer that one of my great antecedents, my great-grandfather, wrote in one of his books. He wrote a second answer. And the reason why I'm calling it the second answer is because I only heard his question and his answer after I came up with my answer. But this is the challenge to the audience. A and Q, answers and questions. You bring me questions, I give you answers, but now I'm bringing you questions and I want you to bring me answers. And the question is again, the Talmud, in the book of Sota, on page 14a, tells us Torah begins and ends with kindness. The book ends of Torah kindness. And the example that it brings to describe the end of the Torah is indeed the last thing that happens to the Torah, the very last, very last event of the Torah. God buries Moses, an act of kindness. No question with that. But it begins with kindness, and the first example it could find is from the end of chapter 3 of Genesis. Why don't the earlier examples qualify? And that's the challenge to you. And my email address is rabbiwalby.com, and I look forward to hearing your answers. And maybe next week, if I get any great answers, maybe I'll share them. And if not, maybe I'll share my own answers, or maybe I'll keep you in suspense till year six of the Parsha Podcast. Who knows? You'll have to come back next week and listen.